guys ready? Yes. Super ready. Yes, it's about time. Welcome back to another episode of the Wolves Only Podcast powered by JWX. Holy shit. It's been a lot. Been trying a lot to get this, this show today like on the air and doing this thing the right way has been a lot today. And uh, just thanks to Mikey's settings and not Steve's settings, we're on. We're here. We were getting censored because just we were shadow banned by Steve. We were, yeah, <laughs> we were shadow banned, Steve. It's kind of annoying, but you know we're we're here, and that's all that really matters. JT, what's up, bro? What's up? What's up, man? You know. You're always working, and for those of you who don't know, JT is a leadership member of JWX and our uh, chief operating officer. Uh, he handles pretty much everything on the front end um, of our uh, organization, and letting go of control to someone was very hard for me. This is something that I think a lot of people that own their own businesses, that are entrepreneurs, they have a hard time letting go of control, and for me, it took the right person to like be able to like fully go hands off, not Jesus take the wheel, but JT take the wheel. And you were the right person for the job. Um, it's all about systems. It's all, it's all about process. And I've always been, ever since I was in my prior careers and things like that, I've always been, you know, show me the process, the exact way to do things and just follow that, you know, um, all the way into battle. And you should come out pretty uh pretty decent um and i think we both come from the same background when it comes to sales process when it comes to things like that so i'm excited to be on this call today on the show podcast whatever you want to call it um because uh, i think it's uh, a good opportunity to kind of tap into your knowledge and your ways of thinking when it comes to uh sales for i mean really yeah yeah, absolutely. I mean, systems and processes get people paid, right? That's what we've heard time and time again. Systems equals success, plain and simple. Um, the funny part about the whole sales end of things is, I mean, as you said, our backgrounds are very similar. I fell in love with sales at a young age. Um, but the reality is, is everybody's sold their entire lives. And that's what makes it so fascinating for me, especially working with people and teaching them the sales end of things, people get so scared and wrapped up in the fact that it's a sales conversation when we've literally been selling from the time we learned how to walk. Uh, so it's very fascinating for me looking at the psychology end of things of why people get scared in the sales process, right? Why in the selling situation, people clam up and you know start worrying about themselves and what others view them as and all that kind of stuff that they shoot themselves in the foot. It's just the sales world has always been super, super fascinating for me. And that's why I fell in love with it. It really is. We've been selling since we were little children, you know, yep. whenever we wanted something, whenever we needed to, you know, you know, there, there was, there was a lot of different tactics that we had. Right. And it's like yep. not so much different than what we do today. You know, yep. it all stems back to when dad would say, no, you'd go to mom or vice yep. versa, you know, it was like finding your different angles, finding your different approaches. I remember when I was a kid, okay, and I wanted something. You know, if I wanted a new snowboard or a new skateboard, I would take it upon myself to get on Word, Microsoft Word, and I'm like 12 years old. And I'm like, I'm going to write a very compelling reason why I need a new snowboard. And I would write it out. And I'd have point after point and I would print it off and issue it to my father and be like, I need you to read this. It's very important. And after reading it, sometimes he'd say no, but for the most part, I think I was pretty fucking good. Yeah. If, if anything, it shows resilience and initiative. You know what I mean? At that age, we all kind of figure out our own systems. So I, I never thought about it like that since, since I was a kid selling like, no, that makes perfect sense now. But here's the thing, selling like that as a kid, right? When if your dad told you no, did it bother you? No. No. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go ask mom. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, but yeah, but and there's there's a few different types of, of kids. I like this. Selling in adolescence. I, I think that's a great title for this show because it is, it is like there you have the two different types, maybe more. 
maybe we can find out what types of kids there are, but there's like the kid that like takes the no and then goes with a different approach. Mm -hmm. But then you have like the kid that'll like hold their breath and I want it now and blah, blah, blah. Right. You have a brat. But I think that the kids that didn't know how to pivot and take a different approach, they ended up later on in life sucking dick in sales because they couldn't handle rejection. Mm -hmm. They get told no and they realize that their way doesn't work. So they're like, well, fuck, I'm just going to give up altogether. Yeah. And then you have the kid that sits there and gets told no and then goes, okay, well, how do I make it a yes? Right. How do right. I ask it differently? Yeah. Right. And that's the, that's the thing the conversation to be had all the time is why as adults do we have a problem being told no, but as children, you get told no and no is a comfort zone. You've been told no your entire life. It's the one thing I guarantee you everybody's been told. Yeah. Yeah. Right? No, don't touch that. No, don't do that. No, 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 no. But what did you do anyway? Probably touch the stove anyway. You had to figure out that it was hot on your own, despite the fact that you were told no. Right? No, don't no, don't climb on the furniture. Well, I'm going to climb on the furniture. Right? All the things that we're told no about, but we just kept doing anyway. Right. Right. And I don't think that I, I, it's funny because actually most of the best salespeople I've ever met were rebels at one point, mm -hmm. had a huge case of rebellion. And I think the people that are laid down like, yup, yup, he said, no, okay, well, too bad, man, man, man. And they move on with their life or they just, you know, I think that, yeah, maybe as kids, they were like known to be like good kids, but they certainly didn't turn out to be hustlers. Well, they, they do the stuff so they won't have to hear no anymore. So they just stay the exact same to play it safe because no hurts their feelings. So what can I do to just be okay, to just be comfortable? And that's kind of the human condition in a lot of ways, except for those who are outliers. Yeah. 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 Like I, anytime you told me, no, it was, I was just going to figure out a way to get a yes out of it. Yeah. Right. It was just another opportunity. Right. And I, and I, it carried over into my professional career. Right. But it's the same thing. Like you can talk about like selling in adolescence and then the selling continues into your, into your teens. Like when, when you really want to start making friends, what are you doing? You're selling yourself to other people, why they should be friends with you. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's ultimately what sales is, is selling yourself to other human beings. It's not a pro product or services are fucking irrelevant. Yeah. Well, you know, the, I think anybody that's ever been in sales at some point, you had to have read Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Right. Yeah. And that's, I mean, the staple book. That's the book that like, you know, when I went to college, it was like, you better have already read this thing twice. Yep. You know, and it, and then I had like classes, principles of selling and things like that. And uh, Dale Carnegie kept, you know, that book kept getting re reintroduced throughout my entire college career. And then into like my my sales career into my adult life, um, how to win friends and influence people were, were always um, the uh, that was just always like the, the book. It's actually funny real quick, just a little off topic. Um, so my wife, one day, one day, she was like, you know, we've, we've come a long ways in our lives. And just to kind of like speak to the power of that book, um, she, uh, she was like feeling down and she was like, you know, I just have kind of left like, just cause I, my, I don't want to spend time with my old friends anymore. She's like, I don't really have any, the same interests anymore. I've moved on, I've grown up and they just haven't. And she's like, but I get bummed out because I don't feel, excuse me, like I have any friends. And I was like, oh, that, you know, whatever. I was like, yeah, but you know what? We're moving on. We're, you know, we have, we have a bigger life. You know, we were going to start spending our time around more people, more predominant people, more people that have our prominent people, people that have more things in common with us mm -hmm. and that can hang with us, so on and so forth. So we uh, took a trip to Schuler Books and, uh, I gotta tell you, this is just like this is just like uh, like just warmed my heart so much. Where we like, I usually when I go to Schuler Books, I just buy a bunch. And you guys know me; I read a ton. So, um, she like started buying some books. She had a bunch of books, and she ha she likes her like thriller stuff and her mystery stuff. But she got caught up in like the uh, the the uh, the self help and the, the other books in there. And uh, I looked over at her stack of books, and she had How to Win Friends and Influence People, and. 
after, and it was just a couple of days before we had this conversation and my fucking heart melted. And I was like, oh, I know exactly. Like I can just picture my cute, sweet wife, like thinking like bummed out, like, man, I just, you know, I wish I had, you know, more friends that I, that I can relate to now in, in this part, in this juncture of my life. And then I saw that book and I was like, I know exactly where her head's at. But that book is such a fantastic testament to exactly what we're talking about. A lot of people, they they don't realize, just like you were saying, when we're looking for friends, when we're looking to um, find a mate, when we're looking to develop a business relationship or a network, it is, it's all making friends and influencing people. And I guess, I guess my, I guess my, I tra kind of trailed way off there and I pontificated a bit, but I, I do think that if anybody is going to, if anybody's wanting to better their craft, that's of the first place to go. My, my, my one other than that is how to master the art of selling by Tom Hopkins. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a staple. Uh, it's outdated as all fuck at this point. A lot of the principles don't apply, but there's one thing in that book that helps with anybody who has the fear of rejection and the issue with getting nose in that book, he talks about putting a dollar figure on your nose. And for me, that is so critical for people who do struggle with that fear of rejection is all you do is you take how many contacts it makes, it takes for you to get a, a call, right? And then from there, you figure out how many calls you have to make to get a sale. And then you divide that sale by the number of calls and you know, figure and you're, you take the, sorry, you take that figure, you divide it. All right. And then you take that figure and you divide it by your sale price. And that tells you exactly how much a sale gets you paid. Right. Gotcha. And then you break it down to how many calls you had to make to get that sale. And that tells you exactly how much you got paid for that. No. So then it flips the game in your mind. Now you're collecting dollars every time you're told no. Interesting. Yeah. Right. So you if know, it takes you if it takes you a hundred calls to get one sale, and it's a thousand dollars, well, you're making ten bucks a, ten bucks every no. Yeah. Well, it makes definitely. it fun. It, it creates a game out of it, and then you're you start to get excited. You're like, oh, I got paid for that one. Oh, I got paid for that one. Oh, I got paid for that one. Right. Right. And it, and it eliminates that that issue with that rejection because. And these and them. these books were written before the technology that we have today, before the CRMs, before the yep. retargeting, the campaigns, all the other things. So it it definitely, um, it, when you go back down to like the, the 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 bare bones of this, we're talking about building relationships. Another great um another great one, and I don't want to sit here and just be Oprah's book club today, but but really, there's so much in in selling that that can be learned from a lot of books. Now, a lot of it has to, it's, it's all going to be experience, it's all going to be taking the rejection, and it's all going to be refining your craft and taking swings over and over and over again. But one of the greatest also um, was by Joe Girard, who um, at one point was the greatest car salesman of all time. He was out of Detroit. And back in the day, he used to sell like 50 to 70 vehicles, new Chevys, um, I believe it was Chevys, a month. Like back then, that was insane, right? Mm -hmm. Now yeah. you have Ali Rita who sells like 200 cars a month, things like that. And like these guys that are mega high volume dudes. But back then, he used to talk about in his book, um, um, I Can Sell Anything to Anybody, I believe is what it's called, uh, the relationships that he would build with people right out of the gate and how he would know everything about them, their kids, their family, and all these things. And I think a lot of people are looking for slick approaches and they're looking for, they're, they're going to like these Jeremy Miners, who's fantastic. Jeremy Miners, absolutely amazing. But it took a lot of relationship building to establish the uh, presence that somebody like him has. You know, everybody's watching and going to these masterminds looking for their hooks, their pitches, their closes, you know, their, their, their style. But ultimately, like, you either got that part or you don't. Yeah. And if you don't have that part, like, you have to work your ass off to establish relationship building skills to where you can really feel good about everything that you sell. And that where you, but because on top of that, you have to fulfill. So when you have relationships with people, like, right, like you get the clothes and that's all you care about. Well, you're going to have a whole nother can of worms when shit doesn't go according to plan. And it, and sometimes, and a lot of times shit doesn't go exactly according to plan. 
if you're able to have a relationship built on trust, built on mutual respect, um, and built on a deal that was worked out that worked good for both people involved, um, you're much more likely to be able to provide a far better experience for that person in the long run. Well, I think what I love about this conversation is I didn't really know fuck all about sales until I started working with the two of you. But what I realized in that was that I had been selling all along because I started the same way we did with this conversation was as a kid learning how to either manipulate or work around a situation to get the yes that I wanted or to fight tooth and nail to become resilient to know that that would be my outcome eventually because I heard so many no's. You know, and like I, I fell in love with my product. So mine was pure communication and pure authenticity. And so mine was just resilience and love for the product, love for the craft and love for what it stood for. But when I met the two of you, I learned a lot more about the strategic elements of things. And I realized I had done a lot of those things, but without systems, you know, but the one thing that I gained from all of this, working with the two of you, getting to learn how sales really works is that you have to be in love with what it is you're selling also. You can't just be a door-to-door encyclopedia salesman and know nothing about it and not really care. You have to have heart in the game, in the product, to truly be able to sell it with conviction properly. And that was one of the coolest like attachments that I had to like learn the entire encompassing concept of the sale. Because like you had said, we're all salesmen, but you guys had truly studied it. I just dedicated my life to individual elements. The the caveat to that, Mikey, is like I'll be the first one to tell you I've never been the product knowledge guy. Right? No, I never yeah, no, I haven't either products. really. I fucking I couldn't care less. Yeah. The thing about it was is I cared so greatly about building the value in me. Okay. And building that relationship. That's what's always made it so simple and easy for me. And you guys have heard me, like my tagline, I say about it all the time. I've never sold a product. I've never sold a service. I sell relationships. I sell human connections and I sell feelings. Mm-hmm. Right. That's the biggest thing is I believe in myself. Pro- product aside, I believe that whatever I'm selling, I'm the best person for them to buy it from. Because I am going to give them the best experience. If you've never been invited out to eat after you sold someone, you're not that good at your job. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. the 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 actual sales experience is is exactly what you're what you're saying, right? It is. It's like it's got. There's like a confidence within. And I saw something today actually that's funny that was like confidence is is built off of reputa- re- repetition off of failure off of uh attempts right mm-hmm. it, it's it's literally like confidence is like it's like not proof that your system works it's proof that you have put in the work mm. and I, I don't know if i said that exactly right but uh, but it, it made perfect sense to me. I hope it made sense to you guys too. But mm-hmm. it is. It's like your confidence is built off of your repetition. And I think a lot of people think like, oh, you know, I, this is a product that I believe in. And sure, you, I would never sell a product I didn't yeah. believe in. But the actual process of selling is built off of true confidence, which is the repetition, the work that you put in. Absolutely. It's like the same thing when we're, when I'm working with our coaches, right. And I'm, and I'm working on the sales end of things and especially let's use objections as, as the number one thing. Right. And I'm going through them and people throw me random objections and being able to handle them with ease. Right. It doesn't come from my knowledge of the product or being in love with the product. And again, I would never sell something I don't believe in, but it comes down to the repetitions and me being comfortable, comfort, uh, comfortable and confident and me and my ability to handle that. Yeah. Right. That's what it comes from. So when people when I, and same thing, when I'm training up our guys on how to run their presentations or how to handle their calls properly, it's why I can jump into their presentation and present it exactly how it should be because the product of what they're selling is irrelevant to me in the sense that I'm going to handle it based off of my repetitions off of my knowledge on how to approach the conversation. So yeah. that's why it's it's so funny. Like we can do like I'll do my my seminars and I'll do my live trainings with them, and someone will pull up their presentation. I don't like how they handled a slide of it, and I'll hop in and handle it the right way. Right? Yeah. I've never seen the presentation before, 
I just know how to navigate that conversation because of the reps I've put in and the time I've spent perfecting my craft. Well, and it's important to work with a professional like that because I was the same way. It didn't matter how much I loved my product. There's still a like a better way for me to present it to be able to convey that. You know what I mean? Because I do have a lot of heart in the connectability of the relationship. I do have a lot of heart in the product that I sell. But if my delivery is not not purposeful, well, and, not put together and, properly, that that makes a huge difference. The- and that's the thing when you when you do have that love for your product and and everything of your system and process is built around that love for the product, you're doing a disservice to your potential client by only being focused on the product. Okay. Because at the end of the day, what you're selling, anybody can get anywhere at any time. What they're looking for is why are they going to buy from you? Why should they invest in you? Why should they believe in you over the 800,000 other people selling the same exact thing you are. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why are they buying from you? You are the product. You are the service. That's what, that's what gets so convoluted and misunderstood is you, are, you are the entire experience without you. Like talk about the roofing industry without me, it was just a, just a fucking roof. Right. What are your thoughts on base statement in that regard? Did you guys ever, I mean, have you ever used a base statement when you like in a meet and greet? Because I used to always teach a very process style of selling where it would go, you know, an introduction and then a base statement. And I would always uh, have kind of a segue into a base statement, which was typically a question like, have you been here before or have you ever purchased here before? Yeah, Mike, when I was doing, especially like the roofing side, it was. How long have you been looking for this? Yeah. Right. Yeah. How many, like it was, yeah, it was introduction, base statement. Um, but I mean, especially, especially the roofing industry, right? We'll use that as like with door knocking. Door yeah. knocking is the most fearful thing for most people getting into that game. But it's literally someone opening a door and giving you a sneak peek into their life. Yeah. You need to be able to analyze like that and find something to connect on. Right? Yeah, I, I never need... liked I never liked door knocking. Um, it's stressful. Yeah, You're going up to somebody's yeah. home. It is I, when I was young, I had a I had a job over like in like in a summer selling Kirby vacuums, and that was <laughs> the fucking worst ever. I did okay actually, and and then I was like, well, I'm done doing this. I'd rather just go wakeboarding all summer. So I quit after like my first month, but I, I did have a couple, a uh, couple sales and actually the commission structure is really good with Kirby. Um, but, uh, now, now looking back, I was like 16 at the time. Um, but then, uh, you know, I had my buddy that had me, uh, sell roofs with him and, um, yeah, I didn't, I did not like door knocking. It was a lot easier when you had an appointment scheduled. Well, I mean, it doesn't help when you're six foot seven. <laughs> and covered in tattoos yeah yeah people probably were you know it's the same know. thing but it, it it speaks to who you are though because i've had the same situations right like you know J- justin you forget all the time that i'm not a small guy either but you know i walk up to somebody's house i got tattoos on my throat I'm 6'2 230 pounds and you walk up to a little conservative lady, lady's house and she opens the door like what the hell are you tells you to get off their porch and then they end up being a buyer. Nothing yeah. is more fun than that process to me. Right. Absolutely. The worst case scenario, someone like looking at you, like get off of my property, I'm going to shoot you. And then they end up buying from you. Nothing cooler than that. Oh that yeah. I, I love it to you and your abilities to connect to people. Yeah. Yeah. No, my, I mean, I talk about it all the time. I turn, I turn people that are complete haters that are completely talking shit to me, sometimes threatening me. And I'll, I'll pull them in and get them on a call and close them up. You know, yeah. I have one guy that is like one of my best, one of my most, I mean, one, probably my favorite, one of my favorite clients who started off real rocky with me, yeah. you know? And they're the, and, and honestly that, that ends up equaling the best relationship because it started off in the worst way. So then yeah. when you make your way through it, through that customer experience, they end up becoming your, like you become their favorite and they become your favorite client because you watch the transgression of it all. Well, yeah, it's almost like, you know, it can't get any worse than how it started now that you can only build from there. <laughs> yeah. 1,000%. <laughs> uh, 
This is cool. So uh, we have this contest coming up um, tomorrow where we are doing um, lead magnets. Mm -hmm. And it's funny to see like the people who gravitate towards like the understanding, the value behind it and things like that. And then other people who are like, what the fuck am I supposed to do with this thing? Yeah. Yeah. And I think the people who have been in sales in the past and the people who have, you know, dealt with like having certain levels of resources when that were given to you, you know what I mean? Like, when you're selling cars, right? Like you have a showroom, you have people coming into you, you have a dealer paying for advertising, you have drive-by traffic, you have brochures, you have business cards, you have a CRM, you have coffee sitting on the in the waiting room for them. Like you, you have a lot to present and to offer to where it's like, you have to look at it the same exact way. Mm-hmm. I have these lead magnets. These are my, this is my showroom. This is my coffee. This is my brochure. This is, you know, all of these things that I'm able to present to people and, and give people to entice them to want to purchase from me. But I feel like a lot of people think that it's like, oh, I put out a lead magnet. This is going to funnel me in, automate, and now I'm going to have paid clients. Like, yo, you got to look at it a little bit differently than that. You A lot differently than that. We got to start taking this in the direction of value, value, value. Yeah. Well, and that's, and that's the thing with it, right? I think so many people get caught up on, they need to be getting paid for everything they do, right? Versus what gets you paid is giving out free value time that, and time again. That was right? one so of the give, things, give, give, take method. Yeah. That was one of the things you and I discussed when we were putting together the lead magnets earlier was everybody focuses on, like the money at the end, not the money making activities to get to the end. You know, and I think that's one thing that a lot of people struggle with is lead magnets are amazing. I've used them for a really long time. It's a great icebreaker so that people don't feel uncomfortable reaching out to you, you know, say, say a word, get the lead magnet. All of a sudden there's some interaction going on, but this is, this isn't even the first date material yet. This is just the initial interaction. You know, and a lot of people just imagine like dollar signs immediately, but this is, if anything, this is the courting process. You, you know what the best way to use a lead magnet is? You use it as a lead magnet, and then you give them something else for free afterwards. Yeah. You double down. Yeah. Right? Because it's it's not supposed it, – and that's the thing is everybody – well, and it also has it, – it really the big issue with this is is the way society is now where everything's instant fucking gratification. Yeah. Right. right. Everybody wants to get paid now. What about six months from now? What about a year from now? What's our pipeline look like then? Right. Well, yeah. And that's why it's so valuable to have, you know, the systems in play, the CRM, the retargeting, the, the outreach, all of those things. Like you have to have that all. And I just think, again, it's like when people first get into entrepreneurship and especially when we talk about like people that are into entrepreneurship and into business for themselves and it's just themselves that they don't realize that like these are tools, these are, and it's important to have all these tools in your belt but you have to have a process for how you use them okay so like again and i always love to go back because i truly believe that automotive sales is like the standard if you can sell cars you can sell anything right and the point is is that with automotive sales is it's been like it's so dialed in like i don't know another sales process that is as dialed in as automotive sales especially if you run a high volume dealership yeah. and you can take, if you can sell cars in a high volume dealership, you are a stud wherever you go. The point is, is that when you do have this process and you're dealing with things like test drives, walk arounds, trial closes, meet and greets, all, and I, that was all out of order. But again, like you need to know. So like all my, my favorite guys that would have these processes knew they had their dra- their drawers in their desk lined up with all the forms that they used and the order that they used. And when they would sit a client down, they would make sure that they had a coffee, pop, soda, whatever you want to call it. They would have, they would have all these things lined up. They knew exactly their process for how they did it. And they ran that process every single time because they knew that if that, if they strayed off that process, the rest of it's going to get all fucked up and they're not going to get to where they want to be. They become a little bit robotic, but in the same sense, they are, they're cool. They're chill. Mm-hmm. And again, that's, that's that confidence that comes from that process and that repetition. 
Yeah. But I think that a lot of times, like when you go into business for yourself and you're not a salesperson or you've never been a salesperson before and you've never dealt with the structure of a, how um, how a, 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 how prospecting turns into, you know, closing, um, you have all these tools thrown at you, right? But you don't know where to go. You don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And then you get excited and you start, you're like fucking like, the clown with the sack of, of crazy things that you're pulling out and you're like, wow, what is this chattering teeth running across my desk? Like, you know, you're, you're like a fucking wacky man and you don't really have like this smooth charismatic approach that you need to have. It's like so many people have the talent. So many people have the knowledge, but they're lacking in the process. I think part yeah. of that process is the confidence in communication also. You know what I mean? Like if you're confident in your delivery and the way that you carry yourself, you don't need to be the wacky flailing inflatable arm tube man all the time. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that that's one thing like JT and I had this conversation in length about the importance of communication along with sales, because you, you may know the product, you may have confidence in it, but if your communication strategies aren't present, you don't carry yourself with an air of confidence then the whole thing can go belly up in the same, in the same sense, you know, because you can be, have the conviction of it all, but if your communication strategies aren't present at the same time, then you're still going to flop a deal, you know, because that's when you start raising your excitement too high. We say all the time, you have to be more excited than the person on the call. Otherwise you're going to be too calm, too collected, and you're going to undersell yourself just based on the way you carry it. Well, I think, and I love that you brought up communication because the main part of communication in sales is shutting the fuck up. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times it's what's left unsaid. It, it's, it drives me nuts. Too many people are trying to talk too much. They're trying to ram down people's throats why they should be working with you. When really what you should be asking them is why they need to be working. Right? You need to be focused on what they need and want, not why you're great at what you do. Right? What makes you great at what you do is being able to sit there and not tell them how great you are and letting them discover it on their own because you're handling the process different than every other salesman that's come before them. Everybody that's come before you has tried to ram a product down their throat. Mm -hmm. Right. But when you're the person sitting there, why are you here? What can I do for you? That's a big difference maker in this game. Big difference maker, right? Because we're so focused and it's what Justin just said with the excitement, we get excited because we start to see a glimmer of a sale and we, it's like we forget that we have a fucking brain and we just start panicking and just unloading everything when it's like, pull back in, mm -hmm. calm down and let them sell themselves. The best, the, honestly, Chris Farley and Tommy boy. Literally, yeah. that was like the greatest moment and the greatest representation. It really is, though. We can laugh all we want about it, but that's exactly what happens to people. You know, they they get it and they're like, yes, yes. You know, they're like, what, are, what is it? Jojo, the Indian circus boy. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. But it's funny because how he opens up. I mean, he's a fat guy in a diner. He's been in that situation a thousand times. You look like a Helen. Let me tell you, Helen. Remember how that conversation started? It was like any other conversation he's ever had as a frat boy in college, you know, sitting at a diner. You know, he's he's down and out on his luck. He's got nothing to lose. Yep. And maybe that's the point. Maybe the point of it is, is that you go into sales like you have nothing to lose because desperation stinks, but that's another conversation. But you know, you're this is your comfort zone. I, ha I believe I can sell anything to anyone because it's my comfort zone. Asking for money, asking for a sale is something I'm comfortable with because I've been doing it since I wrote my fucking dad a letter explaining why I needed a new snowboard. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, my big ass is really good on a snowboard, by the way. I'm sure it is. But that's that's the thing. And that's the aspect that so many people struggle with, right? Because we I've we watch it all the time. I see people handle a sale perfectly, right? But then when it time comes time to get paid, they fumble. Yeah. Because 
we grew up in a world where we were told it's tacky to talk about money and all this stuff. And money was this taboo subject. And then when it's time to get paid and time to ask for the money, people clam up because of it. Right. Yeah, I have no, I, I don't get that. I, I'm yeah. sorry. Like that was just like, it's, I don't, I don't understand it either because if you're going to sit there and spend all that time and you're going to put all that effort into it, why is it so difficult to ask for the money at that point? Do you yeah, not want to get paid for what you do? You can tend to undervalue yourself by making that the uncomfortable part. Right. It's why people drop their pants on price. Yeah. It's why it's yeah. the first move is people just slash a price because they think that's the easy way to get it done. Right, right. Yeah. I, I can always remember my, like, there were the, this time we, we were really involved in my church growing up, and like, you know, kids would go to my dad and they'd be like, Hey, Todd, I got a mission trip coming up. And I just think, and I just think, and I, I can remember my dad being like, just ask. Yeah. And they would be like, uh, uh, and they again clam up and be like, just ask for the money. Just ask. They pick, like, okay, well, I need this much. And be like, cool, here it is. Like the best, the most valuable lesson is just ask. The worst case scenario, someone tells you no. Yeah. Actually, let me take that back. The <laughs> worst case scenario is that somebody tells you maybe, or I have to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. That is the worst case. The best case scenario is they tell you no. Right. Right. The best yeah. case scenario is they tell you no. Yeah. The undecision. Yeah. But in the, I mean, indecision is, is a decision, right? Yeah. Yeah. I have a piece coming out here soon, a reel to come out about indecision. The only wrong decision is indecision. Yeah. I mean, the worst choice we can ever make is not allowing ourselves to make a decision and letting the universe decide for us. And I mean, that's obviously not a sales thing because that, that decision is just going to create distance. The lack of decision will create distance and then you won't have belief in yourself to be able to feel, like fulfill and see your dreams through. But it's, it's the human condition to just like people say, well, let the universe, like, you know, I'll let the universe decide. And how far has that gotten anyone? You know, yeah, very rarely does it ever get anybody anywhere. Here's my question on the same topic. How about the concept that the best salesmen are the easiest to close. Oh, it's 100% true. Me and Thad were just talking about this when we stayed up for after hours. Me and Thad were talking to uh, Adam, working on some a few things with him. And then I was, I was like, you know, I don't know about you, Thad, but I'm the easiest close. And he started laughing. He's like, oh, I'm a complete, I'm a complete lay down. I was like, like, I'll, you're going to get five grand. You're going to get five K per copy with me. Like you're going to get five K on the back end. Cause I'm just going to sign everything to get out of there. Right. And it's simple. I'm not going to argue. I'm just, yep. 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 It's, I was like, I'm completely down. It's so true. And it's, and it's, and actually, you know, I've been in, I've done thousands and thousands of deals in my life, right? Like insane amount of deals in my life, closed a ton of them, lost a ton of them, whatever. And I know the personality of buyers. Mm -hmm. I do. And Anyone that comes in, yeah, I make 250K, I'm a salesperson, you know, I, I sell medical products or whatever, you know, those are the people that are like, yeah, whatever, let's just go. And the people that are always like nickeling and diming and like, you better sharpen your pencil and all this shit, those people are not doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And if they are, like if everyone's like, yeah, yeah, you, you take my buddy, he'll drive a real bargain for you. He'll really get you going. And then you're like, well, what does he do? Well, well, nothing. He just, he's bought a lot of cars. Okay. Or yeah, he's done, he's done this a bunch of times. Well, he's never been on the other side of it. And that's, that's where, you know, it is like, again, you want your buying experience. You want your, like, and I used to always talk about it like this. We love, we like to say ownership experience. You know, I want to make sure that your ownership experience is second to none, right? You want to talk about ownership experience when you're going to do business with somebody. It all starts right at the first pencil, the first, the first number thrown out and the way that you respond. It, it really does because the people that I take care of the most and the people that take care of me the most and the best overall experience from start till their next purchase from me is always the people that's like, yeah, I want you to make your money, man. 
I totally, I totally understand that you're in business to make money. And I'm like, wow, I really appreciate that. Well, I want to make sure that you are taken care of too. And this like wonderful exchange happens to where it's like, we're always looking. And that's the thing is that we're always looking to like sell to anybody. We just want to sell, sell, Mm -hmm. sell, sell, sell. But I don't think, yeah, you, you need deals. You do. You need to put Mm -hmm. deals together that you wouldn't otherwise have. But if you're selective with your marketing, if you're very good at putting yourself in a position to where you can attract the buyer that you want to work with, you should have more often than not people that are like-minded to us. Yeah. I think the best thing you said was it starts with like the hello to the next sale because everybody like the minute they close then they kind of tap out and go to the next sale, but it's about acquisition and retention. We have that conversation on like the calls pretty frequently is it's not just about closing a certain sale. It's about getting them back through the door time and time again, because they know you're the person they can rely on because of that experience. Correct. Yeah. It's, it's it, yeah, it's building that relationship. Yeah. It's the, it's the entire, it's, and it's the same thing I said before. If you've never been invited out to eat after you sold somebody, you're not that good at your job. And I'll stand firm on that. Anybody can argue me that. I, the amount of people I've had ask me to grab dinner after I sold them at high margins, they knew I made plenty of money off of them, yep. didn't care, loved the experience. Yeah. Well, and uh, again, like if, if, if we look at the similarities of JWX and the X force thing is that's the problem we run into everywhere is everybody just wants to sell to everyone because they want to make a quick buck. But if you focus on the right people, the like-minded people, then those are the people you can relate to. Those are the return clients. It's not about doing as many small, quick deals as possible. Justin yeah. said it all the time. Four quarters of a dollar will outweigh the hundred pennies for the dollar every time. You don't. You don't want to sell to everybody. You want to sell. Yeah. You don't want to sell to everyone. You want to sell to the one. Yeah. Well, that's the difference between the walk-in tattoo and me doing three tattoos a week, three days a week for ten-hour sessions because I'm working with the right people every time. Just like how we acquire clients. We don't work with everybody. We work with the right people. Right. And and there is, and, and this is actually kind of backtracking to what Justin was saying, but look, there's a direct correlation to how successful you are with how you make decisions, right? The people that come in and just buy from you, and don't get me wrong, you have to handle the process correctly. You have to recognize the type of buyer that they are and pay them the right you know, pay them the right respect because not, you can't handle the process with that person. Diff- you ha- you have to handle the process with that person differently than the person trying to beat you up on price, right? Yeah. It's a completely different conversation. So you have to be able to recognize it, but those people that come in and make decisions and buy like that, there's a reason why they're in a position to be able to do that to begin with. Mm-hmm. Well, that's just it. The you know we we're we're taught in principles of selling about the buying personalities, and there's four main ones, and, and everyone has different ways of saying this. But really, what it is is it's amiable, um, analytical, expressive, and driver. Right? Mm-hmm. Those are the four personalities in 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 sales. And an amiable person is typically going to be very soft spoken. The, the, there's a lot of tells the, I love my shit Tzu sticker on the back of their cars. Like there's, there, there's different ways to sell to each person. But what I'm getting at is the one that you find to be the most mediocre is the analytical. Mm-hmm. Somebody that has analytical approach to their buying probably has analytical approaches to the rest. And look at this, look at, look at an analytical career. Okay. Look, if you, listen to how dead end it is. Engineers stuck at what, 150 grand a year? Yeah. Unless you're mm-hmm. like, you get some crazy, crazy engineer job, you're pretty dead end in that, right? Yep. We're like these analytical people. Oh, I'm an engineer. I'm, you know, I want to know this, 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 and this. Well, dog, you do that not just when you're buying a product, you do that in everything in your life. And it's why you're a tough sell. It's why you are, you know what I mean? It's why you're stuck. Yep. You overthink everything. You analyze. Yeah. Okay. But then you look at guys who are drivers. They just want to look good. 
they just want they just want to show their shit and they want to be respected and they want to be you know out there mm-hmm. those are the guys that are now going somewhere in their lives they're going somewhere in their lives you know that or that's no that would be more of an expressive person but then you look at a driver and a driver's like just and that's what i meant i got them flip-flopped but you look at a driver that's like i mean business don't fuck around just put me in i don't care what it costs i'm done let's go and the way that you approach them is as a driver totally get it let's get you rolling but that analytical guy people think like taking your time to think about things is like oh well, you know, I'm the kind of guy that, you know, I, I I have to sleep on things. I never make a decision in the moment. Right. Right. How's that worked out? So how's yeah. that worked out for you? It hasn't. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, this is like a big decision and I don't usually, you know, I'm bro. We know. We know you've been wearing the same new balances. You keep buying the same pair for the last fucking 20 years of your life. Like. We know you don't do anything. Yeah. Yeah. They, they cripple themselves. It's funny because people think people think thinking is how you protect yourself when it's really what's detrimental to yourself. 100%. Yeah. Because you think yourself into a box. Yeah. Analysis paralysis. And you never, you'll never jump. You'll never take a risk. Right? Like we're talking, like we're, you know, we're big on reading as a team, right? Return on risk in the Bezos letters. It was probably my favorite thing I've read recently. Just that little blurb about return on risk. Yep. So everybody talks about ROI, ROI. Everybody talks about what money are they going to make back from things. But what is your return on risk? Right. Sure, yeah. you're going to risk things at times and you're going to fall flat on your fucking face. But you're going to learn shit in the process. And you're going to never make the same mistake again. Well, one of my Best favorite- case scenario, you risk and it hits. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes that combated, like, because I've always been a risk taker, you know, and a lot of the people that I work with in either tattooing or JWX, they, they say they're perfectionists, you know what I mean? They want to get things right the first time. But the quote that I heard was, perfectionism is just procrastination masquerading as quality control. <laughs> and yeah. that blew my fucking mind of how accurate that is. Because yeah. there, there are only a couple kinds of people, the people who will take risk in the moment believing in themselves and the people who claim to be perfectionists or analytical, but they're just procrastinating, having to make the big ticket decision because of their fear. Yeah, no, yeah, per, yeah, no, I, I don't know very many like successful perfectionists. Yeah. Well, no, you know what? You know what's funny? Thing. You know what's funny is I used to obviously like, you know, I grew, I didn't grow up with a lot of money and everything like that. Right. And when I started to change my friend circles, right, when I started to evolve who I was based off of, you know, who I wanted to become and who I wanted to surround myself with, and I started surrounding myself with people who were doing way better than me, right, who were were beyond where I wanted to be, and it gave me something to chase, right? But when I met my, I remember when I met my first billionaire, right, I was so nervous. I'm like, what's this dude going to be like, right? And then he starts talking, and I'm like... He's just as fucking dumb as I am. <laughs> I'm like, you know what? There's nothing special about the guy. He just, and then I got to talking to him. And you know what he said to me? And it stuck with me. I don't care what it is. Just do it. Just try. What's the worst that's going to happen? You're going to fail and learn something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's it actually, it really does. It does blow my mind. Cause I consider myself somewhat intellectual and I'm not, I'm not a big thinker, but I, I am a reader and I do collect information for myself and I do like to, you know, I like experience and things like that, but I'm not that smart. You know what I mean? Like I'm like, when it comes to it, like I'm pretty just in my own zone, in my own, you know, com- not, you're not comfort zone, but in my own way. And, uh, and the people that I, that I have grown up with, that I've surrounded myself with that were like the most liked, they were the most, I don't know, sought after they were very successful. 
they weren't like these like crazy brains. They were just like kind of, I don't want to say dumb, but just kind of like they just they knew what they knew and that was it. Like it did nothing else really mattered. Yeah. Yeah. I've I've always been a deep thinker, but I store like I, no I like shit. data. <laughs> you know what? But I, mean, I, I think that's that's the interesting part is I, I am a deep a, a deep thinker, but I, I project rapidly because I store data and I, I take action off of what I already know. What I already know is that by taking actions, I will always produce results. And so right. it's like like the book Ready uh, Ready Fire Aim. That's what I do. I take the action. And I line up as I'm going, you know what I mean? And that's like, that was a huge uh, realization for me because intellectual deep thinker, whatever it is, you can either sit in it idly by waiting for the perfect opportunity, or you can think while you're firing and line up eventually. And I yeah. store data that way. Yeah. And that's, and that, and that's the whole thing. Like, that's what I do. Right. I, I take imperfect action. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like yeah, I think, you know, I, I, I have a process, but it's not dialed in. I'm going to have to learn things along the way, but I'm going to take that imperfect action. Yeah. And I know that I can pivot and learn on the fly. Well, dialing in, which, which I love that term. I've never used it prior to working with you guys requires you to still figure it out as it dials in. You know what I mean? You're not just tuned in to perfection immediately. You're, you're tuning it in as you go. Right. Yeah. But it's like that radio station, right? First. It's like driving an old car with that radio station, right? It's in, but you gotta still play with it. The first longer yep. you drive up, maybe it loses a little bit. You gotta play with it again. You get locked back in on it. It's the same yep. exact thing. It's a constant little adjustment. Little tweaks. Yeah. Yeah. This is cool. This is really cool. Yeah, it's about time I got on here. <laughs> well, I, I, I think it's important because with the things that the three of us are good at, I think it's all different and very similar. So this is a fun conversation because I'm not sales savvy, but I, I communicate based on data. You guys are very intelligent because you put in the time and the effort and the energy in mastering your craft, you know, and that's it. Like, like for me, being an outlier, not in sales, I've learned so much just by working alongside both of you that I, I retained the information that you've been able to study in a much faster rate, which goes back to the importance of working with mentors. You know what I mean? Like you guys are not only my friends who I meet with on zoom frequently, but I look up to you and I learn crazy amounts from you every time we get on a call together, because there are things that I'm really good at that are my, my skills of, of genius, my zones of genius but they, they have nothing to do with the actual sales systems. Yeah. And the, and the, the nice thing about what the, about the sales systems and processes is that you always have your baseline, right? You always mm -hmm. have the things that, you know, work to fall back on. Mm -hmm. And you got to realize Mikey, like when you've, when you've gotten long in the tooth in sales and when you've had mentors in several different directions and you've learned about psychology of sales, you've learned about logic selling, you've learned about all of these things. Um, it's important that you always know to fall back on your baseline. So you're not pouring soup on top of the salad. And I've learned that when I have my exact process, I know when to install my different tools. I know how to approach each type of person um, because I've dealt with each type of person. It has nothing yeah. to do with me being able to go, boom, this one involves a wrench and this one involves a screwdriver. Like, it's more or less like a whole separate tool belt for that person upon actually like going into your meet and greet with them. Mm -hmm. So again, it's like, I hate sales. I hate teaching sales and like slamming people with all the different arts and all the different things. It's like, dog, you have got, you have got to get basic relationship selling down to like your that's like your baseline you yeah. have got to make yourself likable and trustworthy and you've got to make a friend yeah then you can start to, and once you make that friend then you know you know oh that's just tim 
Tim doesn't like to be bothered on the weekends. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, that's okay. just Steve. Steve likes to, you know, he really likes to be noticed. He's going to wear a floral shirt. You know what I mean? And maybe a fedora. He wants people, you know, like you got to know who you're dealing with. And then Steve you can Carroll. start to install all the tools that you see on Instagram from these sales gurus, but they're not preaching the simple shit, which yeah. is make a friend. Well, because the simple shit isn't sexy. It's not sexy. Right. And that's the thing is the, the whole, and, and we get it. We know marketing, we understand it. Sexy sells, right? That's, that's the reality. We know that, yeah. but sexy isn't what gets you paid. What what gets you ba- paid is basic fundamentals, right? Being able to make make a friend out of somebody, yeah. Being able to hear somebody because look, we'll see. You see the videos all the time of these hooks and these crazy closes and all this shit. Did you listen to the person though? Did you hear what they're actually there for? Why are they sitting in front of you? How has their search been going? How many people have they met with before you? What are their goals? What's most important to them? What are they looking to accomplish with this conversation today? If you don't know the answers to that, to any of those questions, then your your hardcore closes at the end. Fuck out of here with it. I yeah. hate that's my one thing. I hate people that call themselves closers. Yeah. So in in tattooing, you want to know the most commonly thing we hear in the first conversation? I can't even draw a stick figure. Do you know how most tattoo artists respond to that? Ignore it. If, yeah. if, if if you acknowledge that that first interaction, you see what kind of person they are, because that's a friendly invite to then move forward into the importance of, just like you had said, knowing the fundamentals. Just like when I'm teaching a tattoo artist how to do their job. I'm not going to teach you portraits. I'm going to teach you how to stay inside the lines. When a client says something like, um, I can't even draw a stick figure. <laughs> Engage with that. Don't move past it. You know what I mean? It, it acknowledge the statement was made because you start that relationship right then and there. Yep, but yep. every time a client comes in, I can tell you with certainty, I've crunched the numbers and put in the time. I would say six out of 10 people say that statement because they want to give you grace in the fact that they're impressed by what you do. Appreciate that shit. It's the same thing when people tell me I'm a hard close. <laughs> Yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. I'm not looking to sell you. I'm looking to provide you with an experience. Yeah. Yep. If somebody tells me they're hard clothes, I know I'm getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody says they can't draw stick figures, I assume I'm not doing stick figures then. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You can that definitely assume assumption. that. Or they might want a stick figure because they don't know how to do it. I'm so There's guilty. The I am so guilty of saying that. I can't even draw a stick figure. I got it. Now I'm going to have to literally <laughs> bite my tongue whenever I go to say that because I am so guilty of that cheese dick fucking remark. I do. I, I do the whole I can't I can't even color inside the lines in a color book. Yeah, that's mine. We got to watch ourselves. We, we think we've gotten enough tattoos to know. <laughs> this is cool. Well, awesome, guys um yeah, we're gonna keep doing these this is fun i can't yeah. wait to do this also get like curtis on get jordan on and um yeah i think we yeah, have we'll these sales we'll segments sale. more often listen guys if you're listening to this and you liked what you heard make sure you subscribe make sure you comment you like this shit and uh we'll catch you next time on the wolves only podcast powered by jwx deuces appreciate you later guys fuck you steve All right, guys, that wraps up an episode of the Wolves Only Podcast powered by JW Fit. Listen, if you guys like what you heard, make sure you subscribe. Make sure you like and comment. Help us get our message out there. If you want to work with our team, go ahead and click the link in the description below. Schedule a call with us. We'd love to get you on. We really appreciate you guys listening. And uh, if you have any other questions, you can reach out to us on all forms of social media. Thank you so much.